Welcome again. Uh, my name is Malcolm Bell. I'm the Vice Chair for the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine. And here we have another in our series of interviews with the experts. Today, I'm privileged to be joined by my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Barry Borlaug, who is a professor of medicine and a consultant in the Division of Circuitry Failure within our department. Welcome, Barry. And you're here to talk about HEFPEF uh, and particularly uh, you know, how this is uh, diagnosed in the cath lab and talking about you know, patient selection. So I, I think this is going to be a topic of enormous interest uh, to our listeners. Maybe I'll just start off with, uh, just tell us what is HEFPEF? Thanks, Malcolm. Um, this is really the crucial question to start with, I think. Um, so HEFPEF is uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, we used to call it diastolic heart failure for years, uh, but, but the current term is HEFPEF or heart failure preserved EF. And um, fundamentally, it's really defined hemodynamically as an inability of the heart to pump blood adequately at normal filling pressures. That's the key. So patients with a normal ejection fraction um, usually have a pretty normal cardiac output. The problem is um, their heart incurs this cost of high filling pressures in order to achieve that um, cardiac output at rest. And we know that some people have high filling pressures at rest, and that's relatively straightforward to identify in the cath lab. But another group of patients, maybe maybe half, um, have an elevation in filling pressures um, that occurs only during exercise. So we really need the exercise stress uh, to bring out the hemodynamic abnormalities that you know cause symptoms and disability in these people. So before we uh, take the patient to the cath lab, just maybe briefly outline uh, how how do you select patients you know, who present with dyspnea and suspected HEFPEF? I mean, how, what makes you suspect it could be HEFPEF and then selecting those patients you know, who would benefit from going to the cath lab? And are, are there other things that you, you can make a diagnosis before going to the cath lab? Yeah, yeah, really important point. So um, generally speaking, these are people with um, unexplained exertional dyspnea and they'll come to their, um, their caregivers, uh, often a primary uh, family physician, general practitioner, uh, with a just a ex complaint of exertional breathlessness, which may appear relatively mild. Uh, the ex you know, obviously, it starts with a careful history and physical examination. If there's clear evidence of heart failure on physical exam, you know, you're you're pretty much done. But frequently, that's not the case. Everybody should undergo testing uh, with echocardiography, chest X-ray, um, uh, natriuretic peptide testing. And for another group of people, that makes the diagnosis there. We see clear-cut abnormalities on echo, markedly elevated NT probine P level, things like that. You're done there. Uh, but we know that a lot of people, probably the majority, don't have a lot of these findings. Um, and those are the people where we really need to take them to the cath lab, to you know, what we call the table of truth, uh, where we get definitive answers. Um, because we know that a lot of people with HEFPEF have this sort of indeterminate or borderline diastolic dysfunction and abnormalities on echo. And a lot of normal people have those sort of indeterminate abnormalities too. So we really need the more um, sensitive and precise test with the invasive hemodynamics to tell those people whether they do or do not have HEFPEF. So, so in the patient who, just, just to recap then, that, so the patients who have evidence of heart failure and, and you know, preserved ejection fraction, abnormal echo, Doppler findings, everything fits together. Those are not patients you necessarily need to take to the cath lab unless you're looking for something different. Correct. On the other hand, the patient who comes up normal, you really don't, you can't exclude the diagnosis of HEFPEF. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. We've developed a scoring system called the uh, HEFPEF score, H2 um, PEF score. And uh, basically, it looks at certain, the combination of comorbidities and echo Doppler findings, specifically the E to E prime ratio and the estimated RV systolic pressure from echo, along with other factors like age, obesity, history of AFib, and uh, treatment with two or more antihypertensives. And this kind of gives you the score ranges from zero to nine. And if the score is like zero, you, you probably don't need to take them to the cath lab. If it's greater than six, six or higher, you you, you, you've made the diagnosis. If it's in between, uh, that's really the patient population where invasive assessment is most helpful. Yeah, that, 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 that is very helpful. So, so let's move to the cath lab. You know, th this is where you spend a lot of your time and have made enormous uh, 
your contributions to, to our practice, but particularly our patients uh, here. And so um, what, what are you doing in the cath lab? How, how do you do these studies? So, um, so we bring the patient to the lab and uh, we uh, perform a, a standard right heart catheterization, um, usually through the jugular vein, um, unless there's some uh, other reason not to. And that's important because we need to have their legs freed up so they can do supine exercise. Uh, we generally uh, always get access to the radial arteries so that we can measure arterial blood gases. Remember, we're looking for HFEF, but we're really looking more broadly speaking for whatever is causing their breathlessness. And a lot of people may have occult pulmonary disease, or they may have a right to left shunt, which may de develop or worsen during exercise, and they develop um, arterial hypoxemia. So we need that to measure both their blood pressure and to look at arterial blood gases. Uh, we'll take all of those measurements at rest along with um, simultaneous expired gas analysis using a metabolic cart to measure oxygen consumption. And then we'll have them, we'll get their feet up and have them pedal on a supine cycle ergometer um, at low level workload, which kind of um, simulates uh, sort of activities of daily living. And then we'll take them up to their, um, their individual max effort. And we'll perform those hemodynamic measurements, expired gas measurements, blood gas measurements, lactate measurements at each stage of exercise. And at the end of that, this really serves as the gold standard to tell us, is it, is it HFPEF? Is it pulmonary disease? Uh, is it something unusual? There are other things like preload failure, mitochondrial diseases, peripheral abnormalities, or is it just normal? And that's also just as useful to have that sort of information. So it's really a powerful test and um, it's very gratifying because it gives us definitive answers. Now, there's obviously a, a lot of data that you crunch through, um, presumably at the, at the end of the case, but there would be many things that you would see during the case, which would be pretty obvious. And so if we just get back to making the diagnosis of HIFBEV, what, what, what are the key um, you know, parameters that you're looking at? And, and, and I suspect you're going to be talking about wedge pressures and pulmonary artery pressures and and what distinguishes uh, you know, a normal response? I mean, if you and I are considered to be normal and we underwent such a test, uh, what would we expect our uh, hemodynamic response to be to exercise uh, compared to someone with HFPEF? Yeah, this is a crucial question. So um, we define a normal, so the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is the single most important piece of invasive data here uh, that we look at, though we look at all of the pieces together. So uh, the wedge pressure, if it's 15 or higher at rest, is considered to be uh, robust evidence that HFPEF is present. Um, if it's higher than 25, 25 or higher with exercise, that's also considered to be the reference standard for the diagnosis of um, heart failure with preserved ejection it, pressure. mean pressures. Mean, mean pressures, yeah, d d defined at mid-A wave or end expiration during the respiratory cycle. Now we look at other things that go with that. You know, obviously, if the left atrial pressure and the pulmonary wedge pressure is going up, the pulmonary artery pressure is going to go up too because that has to exceed the left heart filling pressures. So we look at that. And some patients, they have more of a greater out of proportion increase in their pulmonary artery pressure, suggesting there may also be sort of a precapillary component, which often coexists with the left-sided heart failure. Um, some patients develop you know, a striking increase in pulmonary wedge pressure without much increase in right heart pressure. That suggests it's more of a left-sided problem, but other people, both the right atrial pressure and the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure go up together in tandem. And those patients kind of often have more um, right heart dysfunction and that's somewhat of a different phenotype as well. So um, clinically, this all of these um, can be very um, helpful, but um, by far looking at the, um, at the wedge pressure is the, is the most helpful. The other thing that I think is important to look at is the cardiac output response to exercise. And uh, by measuring simultaneous um, oxygen consumption and cardiac output together, we can gauge the adequacy of the heart as a pump to provide blood flow and oxygen delivery to the body um, at a rate commensurate with its needs. Now, normally your cardiac output should increase by a factor of six for every one mil increase in oxygen consumption. So if your oxygen consumption increases from you know, 200 to 1200, that's an increase of 1000 mils. So your cardiac output should increase by 6000 mils or six liters per minute. So by measuring both the VO2, the oxygen consumption and the cardiac output, we can tell whether the heart as a pump is adequate 
not only at rest, but with exercise. And that's very important too, because some of these patients have abnormalities in cardiac output reserve. How often you, would you see that mismatch? Uh, you know, in half path patients, it's probably about half of them have inadequate cardiac output reserve, even though their resting output looks totally normal. Um, this is also helpful in patient, other patient populations like HEF-REF, for example. Um, some of these patients who we end up referring on for things like BAD and transplant, um, they have a pretty normal cardiac output at rest, but when they start doing even a low-level exercise, they have no reserve. They have no capacity to augment flow, and that very much fits with their symptoms in everyday life. They can't do anything. They're fine at rest, uh, but they can't do anything. And then occasionally we see people who don't have heart failure who have an inability to increase cardiac output. These are often um, people with things like POTS or, or autonomic dysfunction. A lot of them have this very difficult to understand exertional breathlessness, and this test can be really helpful in those patients as well. But typically, how long would uh, such a study uh, last? It, it, it depends on how long the patient is able to exercise, um, but it's pretty quick, actually. I would say I can do one from you know the initial um, local anesthesia to completion in 15 to 30 minutes. For the patient's perspective, it's going to take longer than that in terms of draping, of course, and getting everything set up. Uh, but generally speaking, it's relatively short. You know, resting right heart cath just takes a couple of minutes. And um, we generally hold five minutes for the first exercise stage to reach a good um, workload, but then we increase in two to three minute in increments. And most of these patients can't go that long. Uh, that's the reason they're in the cath lab in the first place is because they have exercise intolerance. So just in the last uh, you know, few minutes that uh, remain for us, Barry, you make this diagnosis of HFPF in the cath lab and, you know, and you've emphasized you know, why it's important to, to, you know, to make that diagnosis or to exclude it. But now that you've made that diagnosis, um, what treatments now uh, are you recommend to you know, patients? I mean, obviously, uh, up until recently, there really wasn't uh, any magic drug or uh, you know, clear approach to, to managing these. So maybe you could just sort of summarize you know, where we're at and, and whether that really makes even a stronger case for um, uh, you know, m maybe having more patients undergo such hemodynamic testing. Yeah. You know, I think it's a really important point. You know, uh, we didn't have a lot for treatment for years. Um, the trials um, have been neutral largely historically in HEFPEF, uh, but we, we do have a treatment which has been around a long time, which is quite effective in HEFPEF, and that is just a simple diuretic. Um, and many patients uh, clinically are deemed or judged by their caregiver as being euvolemic. And we put the catheters in, and again, we find They've got a high wedge pressure. They've got a high pulmonary artery pressure. And simply um, give prescribing a loop diuretic uh, or a mineralocorticoid antagonist can really help those people. So that's sort of the simple thing. Uh, but we now also have um, other treatments. And um, the Emperor Preserve trial was recently uh, presented and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this showed that the SGLT21 inhibitor um, empagliflozin improved um, clinical outcomes. Heart failure hospitalizations were reduced in patients with HEFPEF um, pretty substantially. Uh, the combined endpoint by 21%, uh, heart failure hospitalizations by 29%. So now we have a really, in addition to diuretics and other things like lifestyle interventions, now we have a specific drug that can help these people. But beyond that, uh, many of these people just really want to know what's going on. Their caregivers want to know what's going on. They want to know. They need that peace of mind. Is there an organic cause for their breathlessness? What is it? Um, so that um, offers a great deal of um, satisfaction and peace of mind for both patients and caregivers. And it can also um, you know, put a stop to the need for other potentially unnecessary and costly testing, which, which these people often undergo. So uh, it, it, it has value for many different reasons, I think, both therapeutically and diagnostically. Yeah, those are good points. Do, do you uh, routinely advise, recommend cardiac rehab uh, once you've made such a diagnosis? I do. Um, uh, HEFPEF has been evaluated in a number of smaller studies that have been looked together in meta-analysis and um, exercise training improves um, exercise capacity and quality of life on average in patients um, with HEFPEF and really should be recommended for all. Unfortunately, um, it's not approved for patients with normal ejection fraction by CMS, but in many circumstances, there are other indications for cardiac rehab. They have coronary disease or something like that. So we, we definitely push for that in these patients because it can really help.
Okay. Well, Barrett, unfortunately, that's all we have time for uh, today to, to discuss this, but I, I think you've really highlighted a number of really important points in terms of identifying patients, uh, you know, ruling out the, uh, the disease, you know, um, that's really required in the cath lab uh, and just making that distinction between that office visit and, and the cath lab uh, diagnosis, rule in, rule out. And uh, maybe more uh, exciting perhaps is that uh, there, there are you know, potential new therapies uh, on the block and, and, and available to us. But uh, I think we've come a long way in, in the last few years. And, and, and again, uh, you, you've made uh, major contributions in this field. So um, I thank you very much. And as I said, I, I think our audience will be uh, really um, very pleased with what they've heard today. I think it'd be very helpful in their uh, practice. We see so many of these patients, uh, you know, every day, every week uh, in their practice. So thanks so much, Barry. Great. Thanks for having me, Malcolm.